All right, our first speaker who's going to be introducing the guest speaker is Dr. Cora Merritt. Dr. Merritt has had a very uh, distinguished career in sociology and has had a number of leadership roles here at NSF and at the University of Wisconsin. In the middle 90s, she led the Directorate of Sociology uh, uh, here at NSF, went back to Wisconsin, a stint there for a Vice President of Academic Affairs, back to NSF, mid-2000s, 2007. She led the Education and Human Resource Directorate, which is sort of the umbrella organization that, that runs STEP, DUE in particular. And currently, she is Senior Advisor to the um, NSF Director, and also the presidential nominee for becoming deputy director. So that means that Congress apparently is busy doing other things at the moment and haven't had a chance to confirm her to be deputy director. So please welcome uh, Dr. Cora Merritt. Thank you, Scott, but thank you especially to all of the attendees. Actually, Susan Hickson told me I had to be here this morning. She said, you've often given greetings, the welcome to the step grantees. And I thought, it's because of that maybe I shouldn't show up again. That I've, since I've done this a number of times, people are going to be tired of seeing me. Then it occurred to me, I'm not tired of seeing you. And I'm certainly not tired of thanking you for what you've been undertaking and what you will be undertaking, even though not all of it necessarily will be on Monday. <laughs> I hope and I'm sure you're valuing the time, the discussions, the attention that you're giving to one another and sharing the kinds of ideas. And I can only, again, emphasize, as I have done on other occasions, how important your work is to the nation. As many of you know, the recent National Academies report, America's Science and Technology Talent at the Crossroads, notes that our source for STEM talent is uncertain. The report notes the changes in the composition of the U.S. population, but points to the fact that the growth happens to be in populations that traditionally have not been drawn to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The underrepresented populations that represent over 28% of the U.S. population represent barely 9% of our science and technology workforce. Now I know the STEP program is not specifically or only directed to underrepresented groups, but it is un it's certainly not controversial to note that many find their ways, many potential participants in STEM areas find their ways through to STEM activities because of this program. And because their progress, the progress of those now underrepresented, because their progress is America's progress, your contributions then are invaluable for what we're seeking to do. This is why I say we value what you do, we in the National Science Foundation value, but the value goes well beyond the foundation it is to the nation, and I always like to say to the world, we are a part of an international arena. With that, I am delighted to introduce a colleague who is a long-term champion of STEM education. This is Freeman Rabowski, the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. You'll hear from him in a moment. He's held that post since 1992. I mentioned the report, America's Science and Technology Talent at the Crossroads. He was, in fact, the chair of the group that produced that report. He's been a consultant to the National Academies. He's lent his expertise to the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the national, every organization I can think of. He's been there. 
He's done this in terms of also universities, school systems. And to me, what's amazing, he's found time in this kind of busy schedule to author books, articles. And one of the most impressive events for me is his annual ceremony for the Meyerhoff Scholars, a program he's been instrumental in developing at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, but one that has been replicated across the nation. In 2008, U.S. News and World Report named Freeman one of America's best leaders. In 2009, Time Magazine called him one of America's 10 best college presidents. And just last week, he won the prestigious TIAA Kreff Hesburgh Award for leadership excellence. And this was primarily because of his efforts to increase minority representation in science and engineering. TIAA Kreff called him one of the country's most energetic, forward-thinking voices in the academy. Scott, just before I was coming up here, asked me, who are important people in this nation who know your name? And I thought, most of my friends, I've got lots of friends in low places. <laughs> but I said to him, it has been my privilege to know Freeman Rabowski and to have him know my name. So with this, we are privileged to hear the energetic voice this morning of Freeman Rabowski. That's really nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cora. I, I am enjoying being a partner with Cora and Joan and now Susan with the NSF as we think about these issues of increasing participation. Let me make a comment that I made at uh, the Washington Hilton last week when I got that Hesburgh Award. I, I couldn't help but think back to my childhood. We're all products of our childhood experiences. You never get beyond your childhood. And I said this. Uh, the distance from Birmingham in the 50s and 60s to today is far greater than most people could possibly imagine. And, and I would say to you, I said to Cora something this morning, that when she was growing up in Virginia and, and I was growing up in Alabama, we could never have imagined we'd be sitting here today in our positions. But the fact is that most of you in this room would probably say, that you had no idea that you'd be where you are today. And, and that speaks to the power of education itself that I think we as educators must talk about all the time as people question why we need support in our colleges, universities, community colleges, K-12, where would we be as a nation if it were not for what these institutions do. I have had the privilege of chairing this committee, uh, and Sylvia Ochata may be here, but she was on that committee. I saw her was very helpful to me, uh, to all of us, thank you. Um, focusing on expanding minority participation, this, this report. And what I'd like to do this morning for the next half hour is to talk first about the report for a few minutes and then talk about some of the things we've done on my campus, but what I have seen around the country that's working. And I, I go to a lot of institutions learning, talking about what we do, but learning and exchanging ideas. Uh, and there's a theme in what I'll be saying, which has to do with this notion of innovation uh, and questioning where we are. I start from the position that institutions that are increasing the numbers of students in general in science and engineering who are excelling, not just making it, but really doing well, have looked in the mirror, have seen where they are, and have realized that there's so much more to do that it is, it is not business as usual, and that we have to think about how we change the culture of our institutions if we're going to change substantially the results. The report was written, actually the committee was established by the National Academies because several senators, Mikulski and Clinton, and then Senator Kennedy and Murray, had uh, been told by many people that the report rising above the gathering storm did not did a great job in many ways in focusing on American competitiveness, but amazingly spent about a page on issues of diversity. And anybody in America now understands that a major 
question for this nation as we think about how we will compete globally is how do we increase the numbers of people of all types, of all races, backgrounds, who will succeed in science and engineering. Uh, interestingly enough, the Rising Above the Gathering Storm report showed that only 6% of the bachelors in our country awarded each year are awarded to people in natural sciences and engineering. And that put us number 20 out of 24 industrialized nations. The average for the group was about um, 10 percent. Interestingly enough, I had the president of the Korean Institute of Technology on campus recently, and um, I was amazed when he told me that 70 percent of the bachelors in Korea are awarded in science and engineering. I thought he was speaking presidentially. I'll give you a secret. Most of us presidents inflate numbers, all right? <laughs> we really do. So, so. So <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's a practice. It, you want to make yourself, your campus look as impressive as possible. So I went and checked. It turns out that in Korea it actually is 70 percent. It's amazing. Uh, and, and so the, the fact is that among underrepresented groups, and as Cora said, representing about 30 percent right now with the percent of the American population going up re rapidly, uh, among those groups, only 2 percent of the degrees of the bachelors are awarded in science, natural sciences and engineering. And what we did as a committee was to listen to experts from around the country, to look at best practices, and to come up with a number of findings. But one of the most important findings, besides obviously working on K-12 and building up education and thinking about what happens between undergrad and grad, was to focus on the undergrad experience. And we did that for this reason. Number one, we found that, uh, surprisingly, uh, underrepresented minorities actually aspire to become scientists and engineers at about the same rate as other groups. Number two, it was not surprising that, that only 20 percent of African Americans and Hispanics and um, selected Asian groups, but particularly African Americans, Hispanics and Native Americans, only about 20 percent or below who start in science and engineering, graduate in science and engineering from undergrad school. What was particularly stunning was that among whites who begin with a major in science and engineering, only 32 percent graduate in science and engineering. Now, if you go to many campuses, particularly for large numbers of students who've done really well on AP uh, exams, and when they leave science, and if you just ask them, why did you leave, they will say, well, it wasn't interesting, or I really like English, they will give you all the reasons. They will rarely tell you, I got a D in chemistry. Because students don't tend to want to tell, to say it when they do. But the fact is, the research will show that they didn't do well in the work. Didn't pull them in and they didn't do well in the work. And surprisingly, among the group we tend to think of as doing the best in our country, Asian Americans in general, only 42 percent of those who began in science and engineering graduated in those areas. When you put all those groups together, we can say comfortably that two-thirds of all Americans who begin with a major in science and engineering do not graduate in those disciplines. Natural sciences and engineering. We made a distinction between natural sciences and engineering and broad science and engineering for this reason. We need more people in all disciplines, of course. But you will find that when you look at the, the institutions producing the largest numbers of students who complete bachelors and go on to get PhDs, if you include the social sciences, particularly psychology and sociology, you will, you will find that large institutions, the largest big public institutions, will make the list of the top 25 schools. And what the trend shows is that often they start in biology, it doesn't go well, they move over to psychology. Not the neuroscience part, not the cognitive or quantitative part, the social side of psychology. That is a reality. And, and we need people in that area too. But our report was focused on the areas where we have the, the shortages, the, the, the greatest shortages. The natural sciences and engineering, biology, chemistry, physics, math, computer science and the engineering areas. And when you take out the social sciences, all of those large places are off the list. What am I saying? I'm saying that the biggest public places in the country who do much better in the social sciences are not producing students in even small numbers, five or six a year, who will go on and get PhDs in science and engineering. Now keep this thought. When you look at the report, you'll see lists, and you'll see that for Hispanic students, interestingly enough, 
uh, the institutions that were the most impressive, the different campuses of the University of Puerto Rico. Let me give you a statistic. We looked at the performance of students who would go on to get PhDs to say where are the institutions who are producing un at the undergrad level students who've done well enough, first, that they are still interested in science and engineering, secondly, they perform at a level that allows them to get into grad programs, and third, who actually will graduate from those programs. Who are the producing the people who might become the leaders in science and engineering? And for Hispanic students, as an example, as I say, uh, the uh, three University of Puerto Rico campuses were at the top. And the top one, Maez, actually had 150 over a five-year period of, of Puerto Rican kids who had graduated from that campus, moved around the country to different places, and completed, actually completed PhDs between 02 and 06, 150. If you get past those top three campuses of the University of Puerto Rico, the campus that produces the most, and it wasn't just for Puerto Ricans, but for Hispanics in total, would be Berkeley. And over a five-year period, Berkeley produced 50 for all Hispanic groups. In other words, one-third the number of the top University of Puerto Rico campus. After Berkeley, the numbers go down. There are several U Texas campuses and a couple of other UK campuses, but, but the numbers are fewer than 10 per year of all Hispanics for any campus. I call, I was on a um, phone interview with University of Puerto, uh, with, uh, Puerto Rican radio and I made the statement that the University of Puerto Rico was the best in the country in producing Hispanics who go on to get PhDs. And all of a sudden, I had a cultural experience. All of a sudden, I heard music. They started celebrating right there. I was like, what is this? It was, it was incredible. And then the woman said something that I have now said a hundred times. She said, you know, we Puerto Ricans are great in science. It was a wonderful statement. And I thought to myself, because I go and recruit in New York. I mean, how often do you hear in New York City, we Puerto Ricans are great in science? You get my point? It, and I'm challenging my friends in New York, all right? I'm saying that, that there was that sense that we can do this, that was a cultural experience, and it had said so much about culture change, high expectations, and what's possible. Among African Americans, the HBCUs are still the top 10 producers. Uh, and the top places were Florida A&M, Howard Hampton, then Sporehouse, Morehouse and Spelman, Xavier. And the top place produced 51 over five years. And then with Florida A&M and then Howard and Hampton at about the same number. So they were producing about 10 students a year who actually completed PhDs. Now, what's interesting about that is my campus is number one predominantly white institution. And we had over five years, about 24, 25. But over this past five-year period, from 07 to 11, Looking at those who have actually completed PhDs, we, we will actually have more than twice that number with only 1,400 blacks on my campus. Give my colleagues a hand for that, would you please? I'm very proud of that. And so, and I will tell you that uh, the sad part is that when it gets to the predominantly white institutions, if my campus is producing the largest number and it's nothing like what it needs to be, when you get to all the other campuses that you might think about, the numbers are very, very small. I would challenge you to go and look at your numbers to determine how many have done well enough, blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, or selected Asian groups, who've been able to do well enough to go on and finish grad, complete grad school. Uh, NSF has data that will allow you to look at your institution to determine what those numbers are. And we argued this, that we want to produce people at all levels, people with AA degrees, people with bachelor's degrees, master's and PhDs, but we know we need more people in the professoriate of color. We know that at most of our institutions, it's rare. You know, I've been president now 19 years, and I'm really pleased to say that after that 19-year period, we finally have our first person of color underrepresented in most of those departments. That's how difficult it is sometimes to make that progress. And one of the other points that's really critical that we saw with all the programs that were working, whether it was a minority campus, minority serving, or predominantly white, is that it takes faculty, it takes researchers to produce researchers. That it cannot be a matter of wonderful staff on the side doing all the work. That the only time we can talk about seeing a substantive development of a pipeline of students, these pathways, will be when faculty with power 
tenured faculty in the science disciplines, in the engineering disciplines, decide themselves to be involved. The point that I was determined to see if it were true around the country, I think is true from the report, and then I'll go on to some personal experiences, and that was this. If you show me a campus that has thought carefully about the education of undergraduates in general in science and engineering, that has worked to make changes, that is looking at ways of supporting students, of changing course, uh, course redesign, or, uh, collaboration, all the different strategies. If you show me a campus that's doing that broadly, I'll show you a campus that probably is doing a better job with minority students also. Because many of the strategies that work for one group will work for another group. And what is interesting about that is, I get to my personal experience. When we started the Meyerhoff program in 1989, my campus was considered the most racist in my state. You know, it's more difficult to talk about race in our country than to talk about sex. Because you see sex on TV all the time, and people talk, right? The fact is that, that um, people were very uncomfortable even discussing the fact that we had never had an African-American earn an A in any upper-level science course. When I, when I said that, people wanted to know, well, how do you know that? Well, I was so concerned that the, the, the environment was one in which people just felt very badly about students not doing well, and we were having student protests all the time. And when you ask students what the problem was, people would tend to say something about racism. But not, and then I would ask, well, how are you doing academically? And every student said, I'm doing okay. When the fact was, they were not doing okay. The average black male GPA on my campus was a 1.9 and barely a 2.0 for black females. So half the kids were not doing well. Now, what's interesting is, when I looked at the performance of other races, what I found was that for, for whites, it was probably 2.4, 2.5. For Asians, 2728. So large, and the students in the sciences in general. What was the case at that point, 20 years ago, was that while black kids would say the place was racist, white kids just said it was, it was a cold place. People didn't care. Why were they saying that? Because mine is a campus that's been known for producing physicians. You can, if you can make it there, you can go into med school. And everybody came to go to med school. And they'd get to that organic chemistry, and it was over. Right? They'd get a C in chemistry, barely make it, they get to organic, they get a D, while they made a B in a social science. They either changed their majors or they flunked out, if they kept trying. And so what was clear was we needed to look at the overall picture. Now, what we did that was interesting was to have focus groups to understand what students thought and to listen to their voices and then to look at their study habits and, most important, to look at their academic backgrounds. It is a myth to think that students who are far down academically can come into a four-year institution or a two-year institution and in a fairly short period of time make up the deficit and be on the way and getting a degree in engineering or science. It just doesn't happen. And I think we fool ourselves. We have to determine on every campus the level of preparation in math and science and reading skills that a student has in order to, for that student to have a reasonable chance of making it in science and engineering. And often people outside of the disciplines won't accept that. They'll just think, well, if you're good, you can just help anybody make it. And so what we've been working to do is to figure out what should that level be? How far down in preparation? If a student has a reasonable background, for example, in pre-calculus, even though we expect the student to have had calculus in high school, if the student has a reasonable background in pre-cal, can we work with that student if the student has the right attitude and make a difference? And it's been very helpful to be focused on data-driven analysis, looking at performance, looking at performance before they came to the, looking at the rigor of high school work, looking at study habits, looking at attitudes, and most important, looking at connections between students and faculty. And so all of you are focused on, whether it's with minority students or students in general, low-income students, the question is, how do we help more of them succeed? Well, you'll see, if you get a chance to look at um, any of the work we've done on the Meyerhoff program, we've had a lot of articles, and more recently, what we have been working to do is to take the success we've had with Meyerhoff and to learn lessons that could help us with students in general. Because one of the challenges, as the Meyerhoffs began to do really well, after not being able to find a black who had earned an A in an upper level science course, the fact is that, that now uh, they will be some of the best in the class. In most universities or community colleges, if you've got um, students of all races in the classroom, you tend to think that the blacks and Hispanics are not going to be at the top, with few exceptions. It's just expected somehow. 
And so expectations were important, looking at backgrounds. And then the other point we learned was about specificity. Um, my students who come from the University of Puerto Rico at different levels are well prepared. My students who come from the Autonomous University of Mexico are well prepared. Kids I get from American in high schools in Texas, Mexican-American kids, tend not to be as well prepared. So, and yet we, and what we are having to say is uh, black kids who come from the islands tend to be well prepared. Black kids who come from D.C. tend not to be. Now, there of course are exceptions, but what am I saying? That it's very important when talking about these different minority groups to have more specificity, to understand that you can find well prepared kids from any of these populations depending on what advantages the kid has had, of course. But that often students, just talk, take blacks, it would be very easy for the Maha program to consist completely of black kids whose parents were from um, Nigeria and some other African countries. And we are very interested in those students, but we're saying we don't want to forget black kids who grew up in D.C. or Baltimore, which can easily happen, or Hispanic kids who grew up outside of Baltimore who may not have the same kind of background. You get my point? And so I do think as we work to be broadening, to become more inclusive, we're delighted to help people from all over the world. The question is, how do we make sure we don't forget children who grew up in this country and whose parents grew up in this country also? We need to be helping both, is the point that I'm making. And so what we've worked to do is to take those kinds of factors into account. And what has been most helpful is to get faculty involved. And we wrote a piece that you may or may not have seen in the Chronicle of Higher Education. If you look at called uh, my, co my provost and I, uh, Elliot Hirschman, and I wrote a piece called Meeting Societal Challenges by Changing the Culture on Campus. Let me, and this is in the January 16th issue of the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, we say this, the process of cultural change began for us, thinking about when we started the MILF program, trying to figure out how to get more minority kids to succeed in science, for us with focus group discussions involving students, faculty, and staff, concentrating on minority student achievement. Such inclusive conversations are key because although institutional culture reflects subjective values, cultural change requires rigorous analysis, both qualitative and quantitative. It begins when an institution looks carefully at itself, identifies its strengths and weaknesses, recognizes the challenges it faces, and understands how its response to those challenges can lead to desired results. And so process is an important factor in creating culture change, cultural change, and thus shared governance and broad consultation are critical to campus discussions. An inclusive approach helps to create support for institutional change and harnesses the ingenuity and creativity of faculty, staff, and students. When we started the Mahawk program, some of my dear friends and colleagues were very bothered and thought it was unfair to have a special program for minority students. It took time of getting people to understand the issues before people accepted the idea that perhaps efforts that focus heavily on minorities were important given the results we were having. And one of the things that, that I did was to have some of my colleagues um, look with me at the senior class back in 1989 and I said, just find me two blacks, two Hispanics who have a B average. And we couldn't do it. In fact, on our campus, if a student had earned a C, a black or Hispanic kid had a C in organic chemistry at UMBC, that student had a great chance of getting into med school at the University of Maryland. Because the, the expectation was if you're black and you get a C in organic chemistry, you're really smart. Now that was where, and that kid with a C could get a maybe a nine on the MCAT for the physical sciences. And that was just the way we were thinking. That was not just the way whites were thinking, that was the way blacks were thinking. And so what did we do? We established this notion of building community, of having students help each other, of empowering students. And I would suggest to you there's a piece that we wrote a couple of years ago on a theory of change, and it's in a book entitled Toward Positive Youth Development, uh, published by Oxford University Press, and the key author is Shin, S-H-I-N. And um, it focuses on our social transformation theory of change, and it talks about empowering settings for minority students, a group-based belief system, 
an opportunity role structure where we look at, at everything from study groups to involvement in faculty research, internships, to a multifaceted support system that is, quite frankly, peer-based in addition to others helping out, and then to empowering leadership, meaning, and not talking about the president, talking about empowering faculty who decide to become a part of this work and to take ownership of this process of students moving through a science program. And so we, we talk about the empowering settings, the larger institutional change process, and then multiple dimensions of organizational behavior change, from the symbolic to the collegial to the bureaucratic and structural issues we had to face, and then to major emphasis on assessment and evaluation. Perhaps the most important part of the success of our campus has been the combination of getting buy-in from key faculty who are lead researchers, who have major grants from NIH, NSF, who pull students into the work, coupled with looking at performance in that first year or two. If you can help a student earn at least Bs in the first two years, and the student gets into a lab and, and has a good experience, the student is on our way. But if the student, for example, barely get C's or get C's in the first year of science. The question I would ask any campus is, have you looked to see what the probability will be that that student will remain in science and succeed? And so what we ended up doing that was really controversial was totally against every catalog in America. I suggested that if a student earned a C in the first year of chemistry or C in the first couple of calculus courses, uh, it's going to be really hard to get B's in the next level. And having taught math for 40 years now, I know and you know that the foundation is everything. If the student doesn't grasp the major concepts in that first year, if the student hadn't developed the, the pro appropriate study habits and a way of thinking about the work, the student is at a deficit posture from then on and is struggling to make it. And what we were able to find was that students who earn C's, of course, for the most part, most did not succeed. And so we tried something that was very different. We suggested to students that they retake the course. And some people were very upset because catalogs say if you get a D, and of course you retake it, right? I, I'm challenging you to go back by race and gender, look at students who've earned C's in key first year courses, and determine the probability that that student would make it, just based on what percent actually made it. And if they made it, did they make it and, and, and barely make it with a 2-2 and say, I don't want to see it again? Or did they make it and have done, would they have done well enough to say, I want to continue doing science, whether in grad school or work? Uh, and so in some campuses, when I've worked with them, it's been impossible to think about having them retake courses, but they have come up with interesting approaches to giving students chances to keep building their skills at that first year work through software packages and tutoring sessions, even if they continued on. But the, the point is, there's something wrong with a system that says, well, you barely made it, but you ought to just keep going and you'll be okay. Fact is, they're not okay. And that's one of the reasons they don't succeed. So that's just one of the strategies that we use. All of these, the community building, taking responsibility for each other, all of these things that work so, so much that we've now replicated this across the science disciplines science and engineering disciplines, particularly in math and physics. Uh, and so you'll see several pieces from October through this past month in Science Magazine where we talk about our Chemistry Discovery Center, where we've revised, not only had redes redesigning the courses in first year chemistry, but a redesigning in, in, all the way over to psychology, to changing space, to looking at ways of giving faculty support in rethinking how they teach, in becoming more facilitators rather than simply lecturers, in changing the problems. We actually have 70 biotech and IT companies on our campus. And so several of the faculty are using problems from some of those companies in first year chemistry, for example. Uh, and just a, a great approach. Um, you, you'll go into the, into the uh, chemistry discovery center. You'll see uh, four people working around one terminal. And each person has a role. One person's project manager, one person is the uh, blogger, one person is the facilitator, and one person is the, the uh, provocateur, something like that. And what, what's interesting about it is that they change roles throughout the semester. Their grades depend on each other. And I must tell you, they hate the experience the first half of the semester. I get more emails from students saying, I got a five in AP chemistry. Why do I have to be bothered with other people? By the end of the semester, it has changed. Now, I want to thank NSF because much of the redesign we've done has come from NSF grants we've had, uh, and that helps a lot. You've got to have some funds that can help you to get started with this, but it's worked so well that we have been leveraging our own funds 
to do it in other courses right now. And to make it, to, to what's really amazing is that it's gone so well in science that my humanities colleagues are now saying, we want some funds to redesign our courses. You know, if the president had said, you are going to do this, it would have been DOA, right? <laughs> it's only when faculty say they want to do it. And, you know, when my friends who are CEOs say, Freeman, just tell them to do it. Let me give you, everybody in this room, a, a secret. You can't make anybody do anything in the academy. You cannot. Students or faculty, you know, if they don't want to do it, you know what they'll do? Set up a committee. <laughs> the best way to kill anything. Wait a minute. Great report to get dust. <laughs> and so the, the fact is that the only way you talk about culture change is through changes in attitudes and assumptions of the people in power. And it takes data analysis uh, and listening to the voices of people, faculty and staff and students, to make that happen. You know, I want to have time for uh, questions. And so what, what I want to end with is a, just one story. I'm a... I'm, I, I'm in Baltimore, which is the Upper South, but I grew up in Birmingham, the Deep South. And in the Deep South, we love stories. Um, I had said to the campus, after realizing that we'd never had a kid earn, one of these students earn an A in an upper-level course, I decided to be particularly provocative. And I said, actually, we've never had an A in genetics. And I had my black and white and other colleagues very upset with me. They said, why would you say that? And I said this. To solve a problem, you must first understand the problem well enough to state it clearly. And you've got to put it out there and let people look at it from different positions, different angles. And people said, but it's embarrassing. And I said, it's more embarrassing that most people don't even know how poorly these kids are doing. And even more embarrassing that we think it's okay to think that a black or Hispanic student who's really smart when they get a C in organic chemistry. What are we saying? And so... The first year, we worked on it to see what was possible, and some kids got Bs, and that was great. The second year, though, we were having this wonderful pizza party, and I had just gotten the grades. And, and I remember that in some countries, when young people are selected to represent their nations in the international math and science competition, as they leave the classroom, others rise and applaud because there's no greater honor than to have the best mind, to be the best thinker, the highest achiever. It's the way we do American Idol. <laughs> values, right? Right? It's, that's the difference, values. And so all of a sudden I said we have the first A in genetics. And three or four of the guys from the science and tech schools from New York down to the D.C. area immediately got ready to get up and take their bow. And all of a sudden, I called the name of a young woman. And she was shocked. And there was just silence in the room. And I told her to come forth. And as she walked forth, she began to cry. And all of a sudden, kids started getting up and applauding as if it were a basketball game. And by the time she got to the front, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. Now, some of those guys were crying because they didn't get the A. <laughs> but most were crying because it was a moment of transformation. It said what was possible. It was like running a race and breaking a barrier. And amazingly, I looked out into that group and thought, it doesn't get any better than this when students of any race dare to know and want to be the best in science. So much so that it can bring a tear to the eye. Since that time, we've had 25, 30 kids, minority kids, every year getting A's in genetics and everything else. Thank you all very much. So I wanted to be conversational and informal. I could have done a lot of slides and much more formal, but I really thought it was important to just take questions, just to let's get some conversation going, because culture change is very difficult. You know that. Yes, I see a question. <laughs> it's always great to get that first question, right? I just got lucky. I had a great seat. Mm -hmm. 
when you have and tell me who you are. Tell oh, me what you do. Hi, my name is Karen Peterson. I'm with Daytona State College okay. in Daytona Beach, Florida. Yes. Okay. Thanks for not having snow. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the students that you have repeating the courses yes. that have gotten a C, yes. do you have them go to local schools as transient student, or how do you work that out? I'm sorry, I'm not quite understanding. No, no, they take the course. They will retake the course on our campus. Okay. Oh yeah, the okay. next semester. How do you work that out with the catalog regulations and, and financial? And and often uh, many of the students in the first year or two will be doing. They're going all of the students. A part of our program, if you look at the components, will involve research experiences, mm -hmm. just as we give them financial support. This is what a part of the report I should have said talks about the need to give financial support to students. We understand in this country that grad students need financial support. Federal policies, no, it's for all the federal policy usually does not lend itself to understanding or to giving kids enough financial support. Um, and what happens is the biochemistry major is trying to work 20 hours on the outside and can't do it. Yeah. You're not going to accept, right? So, no, we're giving them financial support. And in the summers, we get them into labs. But if they had to retake a course, they may be taking coursework in the summers to try to make up that time. That's what we do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. By the way, that the first student who took, retook a course um, and, and was in chemistry and got a C, took it uh, the next time, did much better, got a B. Didn't get an A, got a B. But that kid became the first black MD, PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He now teaches at Harvard and is at Brigham's and Women's Hospital. He's a cardiologist and MD, PhD, PhD in genetics. That's what's possible. If he had not retaken that course, you know, the only African-American we can find who earned a PhD before Meyerhoff was actually a kid who came in at age 15 with Mensa uh, and got a D himself in genetics. And I got this idea of repeating because I looked at his record and he literally did much better the second semester, got into a lab, and, and went on and got a PhD in genetics from Hopkins, and he's one of the few black tenured uh, scientists at NIH. Now, I tell this story all the time, and people say, does, he, Matt, does it bother him that I'm saying that he got a D the first time all the time? And for the sake of science, he allows me to say that. Right? Uh, <laughs> you may not know this, but uh, only 1%, under 1% of the tenured scientists at NIH are black, and about that same percentage for Hispanics. That's how far we have to go when talking about producing the numbers. Other questions, please. Yes. Um, Alfred Levine, City University of New York. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I love you, everything you've done at <laughs> UMBC. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about a trend that is happening now in the federal rules on financial aid. Yes. You, uh, I agree with the idea that students should be allowed to repeat courses to yes. improve their basic knowledge. Yes. But I am fearful that they will now be declared as not making satisfactory progress towards the degree right. and will lose financial aid. Right. Right. At the City University of New York, 62% of our students get financial aid. 40% yes. are coming from families whose income is below 12000 a year. Yes. You can get an A in a class and be kicked out of school because you can't pay. Yes, yes. yes. Which is, I How have, do we do this? Let me, let me, I think it's an excellent point. First of all, we get some great students from your campuses. Um, uh, and through our AGEP program, NSF program, Alliance for Grad Education, but some great students from several places at City University of New York who are doing really well. Let me start there uh, in our PhD programs. Secondly, um, this is where uh, university as mentor becomes really important. If you get a chance, there is a, a, a PhD completion project that we participate in, and, and um, my colleagues, um, Dean Rutledge, who is an African American woman who is dean of our grad school, an electrical engineer. Uh, and Scott Bass, who's now over at American, wrote a paper called PhD as, uh, a, a University as Mentor. And it's one of the PhD completion project papers. It's a great paper it, it, because while it works on, at the grad level, they base their practices for things we're doing in our AGAP program on things that were happening in Mahaw. And one of the practices involves having the entire university working with STEP or any of these programs to deal with these kinds of bureaucratic issues. Because there are ways of dealing with them. For example, the financial aid rule is about progress over a year. And so it is possible for a student to retake a course working with the financial aid office, working with the advising office, with everybody understanding what's going on to make sure they get the minimum number of credits necessary to still call it satisfactory progress. Sometimes it's about taking another course that won't be as demanding, quite frankly. 
Sometimes it's about taking an internship to have a, you know, a three credit course. So it can be done so you have enough credits. If the other offices, administrative offices, are on the same page with the same goal of making sure the student can retake the course in order to get a better grasp of the material while not losing the financial aid. You're absolutely right. But it does take people at the highest levels saying to all administrators what they are doing in this STEP program is critical. Let's find a way to get around what will look like bureaucratic issues. That's what I meant by that theory of change, the bureaucratic side of things, because there are always these rules, but there are always ways. When a campus is committed, there are ways of dealing with them. And that, that would be my answer. Do you have any influence or anyone in the room on the push towards tightening these bureaucratic rules? I think that I know that folks at NSF and other places are working on with federal policies when we talk about broadening participation. We all want to make sure we don't dilute what we're doing and that we don't do things at a federal level that will take away from the success we're having in these NSF programs. Um, our report makes it clear that NSF has been more effective than any of the other national agencies in evaluation, for example. The AMP program had better evaluation than, I mean, most programs have not had the level of evaluation we need in order to document and be as accountable as possible. Uh, but I do know that a number of federal agencies are aware. But I think in general, what our report said was we've got to make Congress and others more sensitive to these issues. And it's not just, let me just say this, it's not just uh, minority students at the, at the lowest levels of income or white students at the lowest levels of income. I can have a white student from a middle class family with three kids in, in college and mother and daddy divorced, both of them as teachers, you know, and they're making together eighty five, ninety thousand dollars and it costs fifteen thousand per kid on my campus to live on campus. There's no way they can do that and the financial aid won't do it. And yet they're trying to major in biochemistry. So we've got to be more sensitive to middle class, working class kids of all races in giving them support so they can take the time. If we want to produce more scientists and engineers, we have to understand that the, the students have to have the time and support to do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Mary Anderson Rowland, Arizona State University. I'm delighted to have you bring out uh, this idea of students retaking courses. And I would just like to emphasize that there, we often need to go one step further. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a student will kind of skate through pre-calculus mm -hmm. and they get to calculus and mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. do very poorly. Mm -hmm. They try calculus again and they fail again mm -hmm. because they do not know their algebra. That's exactly so right. So often, it, the, the problem doesn't turn up until one class course too late. And anyone, I believe, can do the math yes. as long as they absolutely understand the prerequisite yes. course. That's exactly and any time right. they get in over their head to try to, as you said, push forward just does not work. Right. So we need to, in, in this conversation of retaking a course, mm -hmm. realize sometimes it may mean taking a step Something backwards you, you, before uh, you can go forward. You, you really know what you're talking about. I mean, I mean it's very clearly, uh, we have, this is a part of culture change. The question is, who among faculty and people who support the faculty will be looking at performance with the level of granularity, meaning literally looking at tests to determine what skills are missing. For example, we had a number of students in Cal-based, calculus-based physics uh, some years ago who were not doing well. And when they got to the bottom of the problem, the problem was a lot of the kids that had algebra 2 in the eighth grade. And they just, so what we ended up doing was developing modules for students uh, using the software that they could use to strengthen those skills, so to remember what they had lost from when they were 13, quite frankly, in order to be able to do better in the work. And so I think NSF's efforts to help campuses, and my whole system is working, the University System of Maryland is working on course redesign, but we've been using NSF money to do a lot of it and leveraging it. And talk, I talked uh, last week at our legislature about using federal funds, trying to leverage with state funds to produce more scientists in our state. And a part of it has to do with having people focused on just that kind of issue. Why are the students not doing well? What are the skills they don't have? What courses offer them? Is it a matter of retaking a course or is it a matter of having uh, more flexibility so they, there, there are modules they can use? And what's the approach to tutoring on the campus? On, when students who've done well in high school, of all races, 
come to college, they tend to think that you go for tutoring if you're slow, if you're not smart. But I don't need that. I got a five on the AP math, Cal, you know, BC, right? I couldn't possibly have to go for tutoring. Well, we've worked to make tutoring, um, the Chemistry Tutorial Center, which is different from the Discovery Center, for years now has been a place students go when they want to thrive, not survive. First of all, we teach them in orientation. You don't wait until you've not done well to go for tutoring. You want to get into those tutorial centers now, get into a group, start working, because you want to do superbly. You don't want to just make it. You want to really know this material. Because if you do really well in tutoring on my campus, you can become a tutor, which is a very prestigious position. No tutor has that opportunity if he or she did not go through the tutoring him or herself. And then on our walls, we have pictures of tutors, and we make sure they're women and men, people from all races, Hispanic, black, all groups who are tutors who are the most prestigious. You know, and you see a tutor, you almost bow. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. You know, but your point is well taken. Thank really you is. very much. Uh -huh. By the way, we are always number one or two in chess in the country. Give me a big hand for that, please. We're very proud of that. <laughs> and I thought about that because when you see a chess player, you really do bow. You, you, you. They are grandmasters. They are very, very impressive. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, other side. Yes. Hi, we spoke to Marlo Thigpen from the University of Cincinnati. Yes. I wanted to flip. We talk about students that hadn't done well, but there are, I talk to a lot of students that are actually achieving, but they're leaving because of teachers. And I find a lot of times we have engineers teaching other would-be engineers or prospective engineers that have no teaching experience or haven't figured that out. Mm -hmm. How do we combat So, so that? again, I mean, one of the, one of the, a part of the culture change issue has to do, again, with how we give support not only to students but to our colleagues uh, so that we can all be better at what we do. And here is the challenge. How do we give support? How do we identify the problems? Because there are people who are not good teachers. We know that. Just because you're a good researcher does not mean you are a good teacher. We know that. Um, the fact is that uh, the question is, how do we build support for the notion of creating a culture where we are not going to point fingers, not going to embarrass people, but we're going to get at the problems? And that's where listening to the voices of different groups become really important. So on our campus, we do not only the typical student evaluations, but we have opportunities for students, first of all, to talk about the best teaching. It is always good. I mean, in Mauhoff, I always, for years back, I've forced students to become more analytical in evaluating teachers. When you tell me a professor is really good, what does that mean? Are you saying the person explains concepts with clarity? Are you saying the person is responsive to your questions? Are you saying that the testing seems related to the lecture? Because sometimes it's not, right? Uh, wh exactly what does that mean? And so, interestingly enough, as we began doing that years ago, more and more people started talking about what are we talking about when we say good teaching? How do we connect the research and the teaching? And then how do we highlight and elevate good teaching? Take ours as a research campus, how do you really elevate it? And so I started these presidential awards for them, and I wanted the best teachers to be people who were great in teaching and also connected to the research, and I wanted the best researchers to be people who were using the research and their expertise in being good teachers also, to connect research and teaching. And what's interesting is that, so that first of all gives you the, the, the positive approach. Then the question is, uh, who are the people in key positions, department chairs, deans, provosts, and senior faculty, who are willing to have conversations about the issue, about the issue. And on our campus, and it's, I mean, our, our chemistry and biology faculty who were older and had really worked in the earlier years when we were less research and more teaching to, to hone their teaching skills. So the place was more like a liberal arts college with the research going on, it was great. Some of my colleagues in engineering were hot stuff, had come out, had been into the research, and they just thought, well, if you're smart, you'll get it on your own. They just did. And, and quite frankly, um, it was true that in a number of cases, they had no idea about how to test. There would be almost no relationship between the exams and what they'd gone over in class. And their point was, well, they can read the book. 
because that's what they did in some cases. So we needed to have really careful, deliberate, non-threatening conversations to, and to invest more in professional development for teachers. And I've got some great colleagues who are teaching, you know. And, and what's interesting is that um, it takes changes in attitudes about it. I have always found that using a positive approach by highlighting people who are good teachers and excellent researchers and having them giving lectures and getting a lot of people there can help to create that kind of momentum when talking about the best faculty. And then the other question is, what is the commitment of the university to ensuring that students are taught? You know, the question is this, and this is K through 12 and at the university level. If I'm teaching a course in differential equations, and I go over, I present the information over a semester, and 75% of the students earn below a C. Have I taught differential equations? I can say I presented the information, but there should be some relationship between what I taught and what students learned. And it sounds like such a, it sounds like a simplistic point, but in America, typically, if you put it on the board, you've taught it. And I think that's where we have to have culture change in America. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Yes. My name is Ricardo Hakis. I'm from uh, New Mexico State University. I want to ask you about culture change at a different uh, level. State legislature. In New Mexico, our legislature is very critical of the universities for the low graduation rate. Students don't finish in a four-year time mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So the kind of thinking that is going on is that full-time enrollment should change from 12 credit hours per semester to 15 so that in, theoretically in eight semesters an individual could complete 120 credits mm -hmm. and therefore get a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea of repeating courses, uh, we have issues with withdrawals and repeating courses and in the state, we know the level of preparation of our students to pursue degrees in math, science, and engineering. Mm -hmm. It's not great. Mm -hmm. So we have to start at a lower level, and, the, and now your idea of repeat until you learn it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so h how do you address that issue yes. to state legislators yes. to help them understand yes. you're going to push us out of a competitive arena within the state, yeah. we won't educate our engineers and scientists yes. so that our economy in the state can yes. grow. Yes. How do we speak to them about that? Yeah, it's a great question. And we really worked on this. Brick Curran, my colleague, and for the whole system, and several of our campuses, I, almost half of my students are graduating in science and engineering. We have spent a lot of time bringing legislators to campus, helping them understand, for example, that when a faculty member is working in the lab, not just in the lab section of a course, but involved in research and has students in that lab, that all of that's teaching. That the best teaching in science is going on with hands-on experiences. And yet the, the credit hours don't suggest anything about how much time faculty spend with people in labs working on all kinds of problems. Number two, having legislators who are at least willing to listen look at the achievement level of students in the first year compared to where they've got to go. Getting just allies who begin to understand the challenges that we face, especially because on the one hand we're saying access. We're saying take in more students who may not be prepared. On the other hand we're saying produce more scientists and engineers. And so I mean, even on my campus, which is an honest place where most kids have, have very high achieved have done really well on AP and all of that. The fact is we're still taking in students who have not to figure out how we can do more to help them out, to get them involved with this, this next group. And there's several things I would say. I, I keep telling people that if we can get people involved in labs and internships and technology or whatever, I'm less interested in graduating in four years than in making sure they're well prepared when they graduate and they can get a job. So getting them to understand that sometimes Practical experiences, internships, and other things to make sure they can get a job is more important than thinking four years. But I, I am convinced that it takes working with individuals who have an open mind, who can become the voices. The question is, who are the people in your state who want to be known as the ones really helping universities produce scientists and engineers? And how do you help them become the ambassadors? We now have our ambassadors, just as our senators. Senator Mikulski is as good as it gets. 
send the card. And they both get it about science and engineering. There's no doubt. And they come around to look at what we're doing. It makes a big difference. I just had, I, 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 I lead the transition team every four years for our governors. I have for the last four governors. So it's, it's, there's an advantage to getting old, right? You get to know. So I just had the governor, and we just had the governor and key people for a whole day looking at the transition from K-12 and universities, but I made sure that a major part of the governor's education, of getting him to get it, had to do with science and engineering and what it takes and just how far, you'd be surprised, the public doesn't understand the relationship between developmental mathematics and becoming an engineer. They think you can just quickly go through developmental math and boom, you're on your way and you, you're an engineer in four years. That's bull. No. We're still trying to figure out how to do the right kinds of things to get kids through developmental uh, math. When I'm in some states, I will get statistics that will say 65, 70, 80 percent of the students in the entire community college system who take developmental math don't make it. We never, and that's of all races. So, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a big issue with developmental math in our country. It just is for all races, you know. Then the relationship between developmental math, as the professor before was saying, you still got to go through a lot of stuff to get through pre-calculus before you even get to calculus, right? So, I mean, but the public doesn't get all of that. And somehow getting people who are advocates for science and engineering to get some of the difficulty we're facing can be very helpful because we have to have other people who can speak on our behalf. That, that would be my, and Michael is great. Mike Crow is a great guy for pushing things. I mean, he knows how to push things, I mean, nationally. And, I mean, quite frankly, he's been one of the people who's been very helpful to the whole country in terms of thinking about Arizona State as an example of a great, as a, I think people outside of your state, I mean, really, I mean, just talking about when they think about experiments, think of that place as really great, and yet we see less support, it seems, in recent times, given the economy for Arizona State, which is a real challenge. And one of the things that's been helpful to us in Maryland is to get our elected officials to see how people are respecting the things that we have done in this system for effectiveness and efficiency, to course redesign, to producing more scientists and engineers. So to get people outside, the people in the state understanding the respect you get outside that helps with, with competitiveness across the country. Uh -huh. Hi. Rajab Akit, Southwestern College, uh, San Diego. Yes. I'm very happy that you brought up the uh, issue of biology and, yes. and students underperforming in biology. Yeah. So my question is, has anybody looked at the order in which students take science courses? Uh, biology is a very complex uh, topic, but we treat it as if it's the easiest and simplest. So students start by taking Bio 100, for example, right, right. when they really need to uh, have maybe a sequence of uh, basics in mathematics, physics, and chemistry uh -huh. before they go into biology. For example, for t to really understand um, membrane potential, uh, students need to have a very solid knowledge of uh, basic physics. And yeah. to understand the production of energy right. in a cell, right. they have to have a very solid understanding of chemistry. However, they jump into biology without really having that solid uh, background. And, and, so. and, you know, every campus in here is different in terms of the skills that a student brings to the first year of the coursework. I mean, one of the real challenges that we found, without talking about what course goes before another, has to do with reading skills, reading and thinking skills. And that's a part of the issue from my perspective, more so than the order, because our students tend to do fairly well in the, bio the first course of biology if they can read and think well and have had a solid high school background. Where they get into difficulty is in genetics for us, for example. But, and, and so what I'm saying is that every campus has to determine what skills and background a student needs in order to succeed in a course on a particular campus. That's the issue. And the question every campus needs to ask is, have you looked at performance in relationship to the pre-college work? And because in some cases, we already know pretty much who's going to make it. And if, if we don't think they're going to make it, it's not a matter of saying you're not going to make it, but it is giving them what I call reality therapy. <laughs> you say, you can't take three courses in science this semester and expect to get at least C's even, based on your background. That maybe, and that's the other thing we did in general. A lot of places will start with three courses. Like in engineering, you're taking calculus and, and physics and maybe chemistry or another, and it can be really challenging. We actually had students take two rather than three to see if it would make a difference if they didn't have so many courses in math and science the first semester, and it did make a difference. Now, some can do it, but others cannot, at least giving them an opportunity to know what's happened to other students before. Now, I will tell you this. 
One of the advantages of Myhoff is that it's based on my own old-fashioned view that if you're going to be in this program, you're going to do what we tell you to do. Now, that's a very different approach. It really is. I mean, because most places will say, well, you, this is what we would advise, but you do what you want to. Well, most students are going to tell you, well, I can, I can do it. One of the reasons my has worked so well, we tell them what to do. In that first year or two, this is what you're going to have to do if you're going to be in this program. We tell them that before they even get into the program. It's about community and that right now we know better. All right? Once you've shown us that you can do it, but, I mean, when, when somebody says, oh, no, I don't have to, I don't. But, and it works so well, though, that that's why we now do it for all students in chemistry discovery. When kids come in with the fives and say, oh, I don't need that. No, if you come into UMBC, this is what you do. And we are very, very rigid. I mean, it's amazing how rigid. Let me give an example. If, you, if you're late for chemistry discovery, you can't get into the class. There's a card swipe at the beginning. And if you're not there, it's over. You don't get in. I was shocked. I, was, I said, they're not going to take this. But it's amazing how freshmen will do most things you tell them to. <laughs> <laughs> if they were sophomores, they probably wouldn't. I told you you can't make it about it. But, but amazing. So what happens, they are running to make sure they're there on time. You know, they now uh, have to lease equipment there because they were having a problem with people stealing stuff, taking stuff. They, there's a person responsible for leasing the stuff they have to use and then, quite frankly, of turning it back in or the group has to pay for it. Again, I've said, what? And amazingly, because we presented it as this is just the world is, we're doing it. It's a, so my, stu my colleague said, Freeman, you're too easy on it. We can do this. And so it's much more in that first period, you're really working to get them to succeed, grasp the concepts, understand the discipline required, the way of thinking. Once they get beyond that, then you can lighten up and, and give them some freedom of choice. But in that first period, I think that first year, high school is so different from college. The testing is so different. I've written the questions for the AP math stuff for years, I and mean, that's formulaic. You, you have problems, you have formulas, AP, AP and BC calculus, right? You know, you've seen it all before, and so you're fine. You take my calculus course, I give you five problems, two you've not seen before because I've changed them slightly. If you haven't worked in a group to look at what-if scenarios, you get a D. So it's very different. We've got to think about that. Thank you. My name is Hedley Freak. I'm from the University of Connecticut. Um, you, you talked about the fact that race is not a polite topic for conversation mm -hmm. in this country. And you also talked about the fact that where you are now is un was unimaginable 50 years ago yes. in Alabama. Yes. Um, but racism is not solved in this country. And so what I would like to ask you as an African-American man yes. is what advice you have for white faculty in this room in terms of supporting specifically African-American students? I think it's a great question, and it works for African-American students, works for Hispanic students. It's a great question that we should be asking openly. We really should. Um, this is what I've learned. This is what surprises people. Mine is a campus that has students from 150 countries. Um, the kids who were educated in other countries through the age 13, or all the way through high school, tend to be more focused, more disciplined, more appreciative than the typical American student of any race. All right? Uh, my my uh, black students who grew up in D.C. through the seventh grade, Nigerian kids, are sent back to Lagos for boarding school. Then they come to UMBC. I can immediately tell the difference between kids who grew up in Montgomery County in high school versus those who are from Lagos. The Lagos kid will say, how are you today, sir? All right? The kid out of Montgomery County, which is a good school system, would say, what's up, Doc? <laughs> they start off, right? And all from the beginning, that humility shows the difference. The one who's saying, so he would say, what do you think I should do? How high should I jump? The kid from Montgomery County, why do I have to do that? <laughs> right? Yeah. The attitude change. This is different. So what am I saying? I'm saying several things. Number one, the way you work with some people may be different from others, just among blacks or among Hispanics. Depends on their cultural background, many things. But here's the point. People assumed for years that the reason Meyerhoff worked so well was that I had all these committed black faculty who were helping the kids. I didn't have any black. We didn't have any black faculty in that period. They were primarily, first of all, white men. Because until we got the NSF Advanced Program, only 12% of my tenured faculty in science and engineering, tenured tenure faculty, were women. Only 12% up until eight years ago. 12%. Now, because of advance, we're at 39%. Very different situation. Now, it's true. One or two women who were very strong were very helpful to us with Myhoff, but most of the faculty 
teaching these students were, were white men. What made the difference? Building trust with those students, having honest conversations, talking with minority staff, black, Hispanic, about the issues, having a friend they can say, well, this, this is what I'm going through right now. And I want to push this kid because the kid is not working up to his potential. But I'm worried that people are going to misperceive my motives or whatever, right? Talking it through with this is where staff become very important to give you some perspective and suggestions about approaches to be used. Then having conversations where we sit and just discuss, this is what I'm going through. This, these kids think I'm being too hard on them. I'm doing it because I know they can do more. What should I do? How should I do it? I think having the honest conversations first with staff members or other minority staff, a faculty in other departments first, and then secondly, having honest conversations with those students saying, listen, if I didn't believe in you, I wouldn't be so hard on you. I want to know that white faculty are hard on as long as they are showing that they care also. When you show that you care, you can push. You can really push. You know what I tell students? And I've got faculty that we don't just want you to get A's. We want you to get high A's. I don't want you to go, I got an A. I want you to, get, I want you to know so much, you don't even worry about the grade. You're just excited about the work. You know what I mean? It's that level. You know, oh, that a man's reach should exceed his grasp of what's happening. You want to just really be daring to know more than the professor. Far more than is expected on the test. It's that idea. But students can tell when faculty care. They really can. And can really appreciate it when a faculty member is hard on them, especially if it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, where some faculty get into difficulties when they become really harsh in a group setting. A lot of students of any race can get a little bothered. But when you can take a student aside and say, listen, I, I think enough of you that I want to tell you the truth. You're not working hard enough. You have too much potential in this place to be slacking. And I think it just takes that honest approach. People can tell authenticity. They can pick it up in a minute. The worst thing is for them to see a faculty looking at them and saying, well, get to see, that's good for him. High expectations, I would say. One last question. Uh -huh. uh, hi, I'm uh, Michael Georgopoulos, University of Central Florida in Orlando. I am glad that you talked that uh, in your programs it's important to offer financial support for uh, the students so that they have the time to spend with their academics and the out of uh, the courses uh, opportunities that they might have. Yes. What happens if you are faced with a situation where you have uh, a lot more students that you think you can help, yes. but the finances are not there, especially yeah in a time of decline in state budgets yes. and all these kinds of things. What do you yes. do? You know, we are trying to write more grants from a lot of places. We've actually taken more money from other scholarship programs uh, in other areas to focus on science. Um, we, we, we had reductions in federal funding for Malhoff even. And this is when you know you have institutional commitment. My colleagues came together with my not being there and donated money to the scholarship pool several years ago because we've had a decline if, if, and, and because they didn't want to see us stopping what we were doing while trying to find federal money and they ended up putting together 900000 to the base. Now that was, that was institutional commitment from all over that campus saying this is a program that defines who we are. And the question becomes for every campus how important does the campus consider the production of scientists and engineers of all races? And that's the language we use. The production of scientists and engineers of all races, men and women, what do we need to do to take it to the next level? I will tell you this, the campuses that are most effective will ultimately be the campuses that companies and other places want to connect with more and more. You need to make the argument to, to senior level people, the more we produce these people, the more companies will come, the more support they'll give us even. The other thing we've done is to get students really in technology areas and in some science, we've got a lot of our students working in the biotech companies on campus. So we've got, when we didn't have scholarship money, we've gotten them working in companies to help them get money in companies involving science where they're working in labs. And that's made all the difference in the world. Let me say this to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, um, I did not think in 1989, I did not know if I would be able to work with colleagues to create a climate in which faculty and administrators expected large numbers of minority students, African Americans and Hispanics, succeed in science. I went around the country. I could not find a place that was producing 
10 students who got PhDs a year in the nation. All right? The schools that were doing the best were totally minority, and I was proud of them. But the vast majority, for example, of black students, right now, 75% are in predominantly white universities. The HBCUs, for example, are doing a great job. I mean, they, those best places are really on it. But I'm thinking, my God, 75% of the kids though, are going to these other places, these big-name places because it's considered prestige, and they're getting wiped out. And the question was, is it possible to change? What I've come to know is this. People respect high standards. People respect high standards. People rise to expectations. And if you can set a vision that focuses on students of all races working really hard in those labs and getting excited about the work, the enthusiasm builds. And before you know it, you're hearing people talking about HIV research all over the campus. And so from my perspective, it's not about an individual. It's not just about money. It's about all of us. The more passion you have for the work, the more scientists you will produce. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I never thought I would ever say this about myself, but when I grow up, I want to be president of a university. <laughs> <laughs>